Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. So today, um, Anand is uh, he's putting out some fires, so he can't be here today. But uh, I'm Mark Hamilton. I'm a software engineer on Microsoft's Applied AI team. We make the cognitive services and a bunch of other stuff. And today, I want to share with you some work that we've been doing as part of Microsoft Machine Learning for Apache Spark, our open source initiative to expand Spark into new places that Spark has not ventured before. And so this work is about integrating the Azure Cognitive Services directly into Spark so that you can utilize Microsoft's whole ecosystem of smart things in the cloud. So the basic overview is that we'll talk a little bit about what the cognitive services on Spark are, how to use them in a basic sense, and then how to use them in, a, in an advanced sense. And then we'll talk about the more general framework that this is all built on, HTTP on Spark, which is the a full integration between Spark and the HTTP protocol. We'll talk about how you can make clusters with embedded cognitive services so that you don't have latencies of the cloud. And then uh, finally, I'll save uh, the fun part for last. We'll show how we can use this to create a really fun app that we partnered with the Metropolitan Museum of Art for to create uh, an experience where you can play with a deep art GAN and then use it to explore the actual Mets collection. So a bit of motivation. Um, you might have seen the keynote about seeing AI. That seeing AI is uh, an application that is built to help those with visual impairments. And the basic structure, and this video isn't playing, well, the basic structure of this app is that there are many different kinds of intelligent services baked within it that do various different things. In the one that's supposed to play in this video, what is a, a captioning service. So every single photo you take, it'll provide a rough high-level description so that if you can't actually see what it is you just took a photo of, you'll be able to hear it. And not only will it just tell you the text, but it'll speak it out to you. And so if you were building this kind of an application, you might think like, oh my god, I gotta figure out how to one, do scene parsing, so translation of scenes to text, which is like a non-trivial research problem and is gonna involve definitely a GPU machine and definitely a, a bunch of dev time. And then you also have to think, well, now that I have the text, I need to speak it out, so you're also now like a text-to-speech -to translation architect. And so very quickly, the app gets um, almost untenable unless you can hook into you know, some quality pre-built intelligent services in order to make this possible. And so for this particular functionality, it's, it's not like thousands of hours worth of dev time and training the model yourself. It's like two web calls, like one to the computer vision service on Azure and then one to the text-to-speech service on Azure. And so very quickly, you can create an app without having any knowledge of machine learning, but just knowing kind of what you want to do at a high level. And so this is what the, the cognitive services provide. You don't need time-intensive training process or deployment process. You can quickly create intelligent applications. And more broadly within Microsoft is that if you can work with these, you can leverage all of Microsoft research, basically, because the business model is that MSR creates something really new and groovy, and they stick it up there in a cognitive service and sell it. And so if you have the ability to work with these cognitive services, you kind of have this ever-expanding avenue to put intelligence into your models. And also, they're constantly updated. So like the speech and things like that, every year will get better and better and better. And you want to be able to hook into that without redeploying your Spark pipeline. And so just to you know, really hammer this point in, this is like the list of cognitive services as of a few uh, weeks ago in that there's just a ton of them across all these different varieties and they do all sorts of crazy things. And so it covers like vision, speech, language, creating structured knowledge from unstructured knowledge, dealing with search both on the web and for your own documents. So there's a ton of stuff out there. And so what we'd like to do is um, provide an easy to use integration, integration between the Spark ML distributed machine learning library and the Azure Cognitive Services so that you can really easily leverage this kind of intelligence directly within your Spark computations without having to think, like, am I using something backed by a cloud API? And so it's in the Spark ML language, it's open source, and it's composable with all the other Spark ML models, so you can really, really easily click these things in. Um, we've written the core code in Scala, but exposed it out to Python and R through an automatic binding creation engine that we also um, contributed open source. 
And so the basic usage of this kind of a thing is that um, it looks and feels a lot like every other Spark ML model where you create a model, like a new text sentiment model, you set the text column, like give it a column of the data frame, you set what you want the outputs to be, sentiment we'll call them, and then you transform the data frame. And so under the hood, this will take care of a lot of stuff for you, and it will very importantly um, you know, give you bad performance, because we've hooked and we've baked a lot of optimizations in under the covers. And so how many of you guys saw the keynote yesterday, just so I can get a rough sense? So I guess, yeah, most of you guys. So I'll, I'll jump through this fairly quickly so that we can just focus on the important part. So for those of you that um, I guess weren't at the keynote, probably very few, that the, the main goal of this particular project was to create uh, a model for seeing AI, namely a currency detector, and show how you, know, you can bypass a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of the dev legwork, by using some cognitive services, not just to evaluate, but to create a training data set. And so in this particular example, we'll use Bing image search on Spark to be able to pull a fully labeled classification data set straight out of the, the cloud effectively. For, and we use this for currency, but it's really a demo factor. You just change out the currency and you get any old classifier you really want. And so I didn't have time to do this in the demo yesterday, but we can really dive into what it is we're doing in this function. So this is the kind of core function here. What it is is that we're creating a Bing image search transformer here on line 10. We set its subscription key, so this is the key you get when you make a cognitive service. Um, we set a column of offsets. So offsets allow you to page into Bing. It's kind of like, a, um, you know, you don't just want the first result, you want the first 30 pages of results for each one of these queries. And so we have a column, namely this list right here, that effectively goes from zero to the number of pages, multiplies them by 10, the amount of images you get per gulp. And so our data frame that's coming in is uh, the outer product of the queries with the offsets. And so what that means is, uh, if you're familiar with the outer product, it's kind of like for every single query in our list, we want to get the first 10 pages. And for every single, so that you effectively get uh, a large data frame, that your two columns, queries and offset, parameterize each individual web request. And you can set other parameters for Bing. So for Bing image search, there's a ton of different parameters you can play with. You can set the count, the number of images that are returned. You can set filters, so you can set the image type, and you can set you know, whether you want safe search on or off, whether you want copyrights on or off, whether you want drawn images, what color, what size, every single thing you could possibly you know, poke and prod in Bing image search is exposed as a setter and um, a getter in this particular um, Spark ML model. So we've gone and done all of that so that you can use IntelliSense. You know what it is you're trying to find. And so this is the, the core model. And then actually evaluating this model is really simple in Spark ML. It's model.transform. And then um, we also transform it again because Bing will return not just the URLs but every single piece of information under the sun about what it is you're getting. You'll get like whether it's a product or whether it's this, that, or the other thing. And so we've included a nice utility function just to pull out the URLs, which is in this particular case just what you want. And so we'll apply this a few times, one for each particular kind of query, and you'll see my queries are like $1, $1 bill on the table, $1 bill, just to get a, a, a rough diversity of images. And super quickly, we get that we get a whole bunch of data frames. And right now I'm showing the top five rows, but really these are like, you know, four queries times 10 times 10. So, uh, you know, a lot of images in these data frames. And so the basic idea is that when you're doing a classification task, you know, you can get a lot with really good hand-labeled data. But you can also get a lot by having a lot of, uh, you know, potentially dirtier data, but you have a lot more of it to give your algorithm kind of a rough base to build on. And you can always augment it with neater data as well, because, you know, not going to lie, Bing is not going to return $1 bills entirely. You know, there's going to be some fives mixed in, and there's going to be some tens mixed in. And so, you know, now that you have a data frame of, of queries, uh, I mean, of, of images, you can easily 
take these images, distribute them amongst all the workers of your cluster. That's this repartition here. And you can use, a, we have included a, a URL downloader that will do this asynchronously so that it's a bit faster. And so what this kind of leverages is that the internet in, in the wide sense doesn't really have an SLA. These images are, are big and they're hosted on really garbage servers that take a long time. And so this is where you really see and reap the benefits of having a Spark cluster because each one of your workers is using its full networking capability to pull from these URLs and pull them down into bytes on your cluster. And so that's what that particular function does. We can then drop anything that failed because this Bing image search download from URL function will return null if it fails to download in 50 seconds or something like this. And we can split it into a training and testing set. And so that's kind of how easy it is to work with this where you no longer need to think about, oh, I gotta boot up a client and I have to manage this client and I have to pack and unpack web requests. You just use it like it's code. And that's really the goal, is to make it way easier to use these and to have it scale with the workers in your cluster, that you get to leverage the full networking capabilities of your cluster when you work with the cognitive services on Spark. So I talked a little bit about the, the APIs of the cognitive services on Spark, and this is something that we've really tried hard to make as flexible as possible, but also as easy as possible. So like the basic use case for Bing image search is you think like, I got a data frame of queries. Let me do a search for each one of these queries. And so that's a nice, very simple thing. You set a query column. So that means that that particular web request is parameterized in each query fills its value from the data frame. And you can just pass it a data frame, a very simple data frame with one column named queries with all the different queries that you might want. But, you know, if you wanted to do something slightly different, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can work with these services. So say I just had one particular query, cats, and I wanted to pull the first zillion pages of cats because I love them so much. And so instead of parameterizing your queries or your service requests, based on just the words in your data frame, you wanna parameterize these by the offsets. So what you really want is to parallelize or vectorize your requests on these offsets. And so you'll see that the difference is that instead of query call, it just turns to query, which means you're giving it a single value. And now offsets, which didn't need to be filled out in the previous one, becomes offset call. And so this, is the way it works for every single parameter of the requests. And so every single button, dial, and knob has both a static value that you can set or a, a column parameterized value that will also check the schema and make sure everything is okay. And so it lets you do a lot more robust and crazy different kinds of queries all while having a nice simple API. So in this particular case, we might want to query from a random offset, a random query, and even use a random service. And so this is in particular for these kinds of customers that they're so big that any one particular service key is too little for them. You can even parallelize across different services and use different service keys. So you can really you know, squeeze out as much throughput as humanly possible. And so what's nice is that this is just kind of a, a three-liner three over here. And the API will scale to the complexity of how you want to use it, where if you want to parameterize it by every single thing, you'll just find yourself using a lot of the column setters. But if you don't care about that, you don't have to worry about creating a data frame with all of that redundant information in it. And furthermore, it's, um, you get a lot of things for free. We try to make this as um, robust as possible for you so that you don't have to worry about the legwork of, of retrying and batching and back offs and back pressure, lots of bees. Um, so here is kind of an experiment we did where we had a big 10 node Spark cluster. We wanted to send 20,000 requests up, but our service, we rate limited it to 1,000 requests a minute, which is you know, a fairly reasonable thing for a server to do. 
And if you don't use any of these features, what you find is that you know, 18,000 of your requests fail because you get the first 2,000 requests in, or first, sorry, uh, 1,000 requests in, and then you start hitting the rate limit because um, you've just sent in 1,000 requests and it hasn't been a minute. And so you'll find very quickly that you'll just oversaturate your server and you won't get anything done. But when you have something like automatic batching or exponential backoffs or something, you can actually wait and wait for the server to say, no, I want more data now. I'm ready to roll. And so with that, it takes a lot more time because it doesn't you know, immediately respond, but at least you get zero errors because it's um, actually waiting and talking with the server and doing all the handshakes it needs. And um, when you add in batching into this picture, you now take those 20,000 requests and turn them into you know, 200 requests that are a lot beefier but um, don't really clog up the network as much. And then finally, um, asynchronous parallelism is that last cell. And uh, it's frequent when you're working with a, a high throughput service that you, when you send a web request, you send it data, you wait for it to do its computations, it sends you data back, and then you keep on going. But sending the data up and waiting and getting the data in return doesn't use really much of your CPU at all. Um, and it also doesn't use a lot of your network because there's a lot of time waiting for the server to do its thinking. So you can get a lot more bang for your buck by doing this in parallel. And this is beyond just the parallelism of your Spark cluster. This is asynchronous parallelism. So you s use the full networking capabilities of your cluster in every single parallel way. So this, what this means is that we have a setting for asynchronous parallelism on all of these different web clients, and it means that you'll send up five requests before, or send up n requests before waiting on the first one. And so that lets you really uh, keep the pipeline full and squeeze out every last bit of throughput you could possibly muster. And so, you know, it's not like we just built this just for the Microsoft Cognitive Services. That's kind of a natural example of a service that's useful to talk to via Spark. What we really wanted was something a lot more fundamental and general that could grow as new services came and as, you know, we wanted to integrate with more and more tools across the Apache Spark ecosystem. So this is where this project HTTP on Spark kind of got its roots. The idea is that we want to have a full integration between the entire HTTP protocol and Spark SQL so that you can work with HTTP in any of the languages of Spark, be it Python or Scala or Java or wherever you get your .NET now, wherever you get your Spark, you want to be able to kind of hook into all of these nice functionalities like asynchronous parallelism and automatic batching and stuff. And really what this lets you do is use your Spark cluster as a, as a microservice orchestrator. You can now talk to all sorts of different kinds of, of compute and all sorts of different kinds of ecosystems in the same way, using kind of the universe's standard language of interprocess communication, HTTP. And so really what this aims to do is provide a, a principled way to integrate whatever kind of thing you want into Spark so that you don't have to go through the horrible rigmarole that we go through when we you know, hook something in using SWIG or hook something in using even like the PySpark protocols because those are all Spark specific and you have to learn them and you have to figure them out. Um, this really provides a, a general way that will work with your existing services. You don't need to do any special code. And uh, over here on the your right, I guess, is um, an example of, of how to hook into this. So we have this SparkML model called the Simple HTTP Transformer, and it will do, it will take your data, it will use an input parser, in this case we give it a JSON input parser, which is also a SparkML model. It will transform your data, pack it into a nice JSON object, put that in the body of the request, send it up there, get the response back, unpack it into the particular schema that you want, um, that you specify here, and then you go on through your computation. And so if your web request talks JSON and spits back out JSON and has a nice schema to it, then you can you know, immediately hook it in with only a few lines of code. And, um, but more fundamentally, we've, uh, this is the simple HTTP transformer. We have the HTTP transformer that is a little less simple because it deals with the full HTTP protocol, and this is just a simple layer on top of that. And, the way that this architecture kind of works is that a Spark cluster has lots of Spark workers, 
And these Spark workers process partitions of data. And it's not like uh, every partition is a thread. Every partition is a chunk of data that will be worked on by a single thread. So slightly different. But the basic idea is that each chunk of data, before you start processing the data, you'll do the heavy lifting of spinning up a client. And um, then that client will persist for the whole partition. It will efficiently send up its requests, doing asynchronous parallelism and all of that stuff and retries. And um, it will talk to your web service. So when we initially made this, we were thinking like, great, we have cloud services, right? But that's not the, the only service that exists. You know, a lot of times, if you want lower latencies, you can actually take these services and put them on the worker nodes themselves. And this is the basis for PySpark and for Spark R in that they don't integrate by you know, running Spark through, running Python through function dispatch. They integrate through having a separate thread of Python and communicating with that separate thread over a local networking connection. So what this effectively lets you do is um, kind of generalize that PySpark process using HTTP as opposed to this uh, very particular kind of protocol that PySpark uses. And so um, this becomes really useful when you start thinking about the cognitive services as containers. So this is a recent announcement that our team made um, back a few weeks ago, or maybe a few months ago now. And it's the really exciting news that all of the Microsoft cognitive services will be aiming to be made into containers, that this is kind of the gold standard for a Microsoft cognitive service, in that that intelligence that you get up in the cloud, you should be able to take it, put it in a container, and run it wherever you want to locally. And so already this is um, supported for key phrase extraction, language detection, sentiment, face, OCR, a language understanding, which is a very complicated service that does all sorts of sentiment and knowledge extraction. And there will only be more added. This is kind of a company-wide initiative to bring as many of the services into containers as possible so that also you can run it in compliant ways if, let's say, you want to run it on your own cluster or you can run it within your own VNet things like this. And so these are available today in public preview. The APIs are exactly the same, which is really nice because, you know, in the cognitive services on Spark, you just point it at the, the cloud endpoint and you can talk to the cloud. Or if you have your own setup, you just point it to that instead. And the existing cognitive services on Spark will just work again because it's the exact same API. Um, the contact to the billing service is required, so it's kind of low network connectivity, but there will soon be um, avenues that don't require that. And so, yeah, this is kind of the architecture of what we've been, been working on internally in Microsoft in that you have this Spark Scala process, and we also have a little local cognitive service running that's all inside of the worker, and we communicate to the local cognitive service through HTTP. And just for clarity, this is exactly how PySpark works, and that you have this local Python process, and you communicate to and fro from Scala using the PySpark protocol. And this really lets you bring the compute directly to the data, no networking required other than local networking, and so it's a lot lower latency. And so to make these kind of architectures a lot easier, one of our collaborators, Lisa Banda, um, worked incredibly hard to create a, a Helm chart that kind of did all sorts of crazy things in addition to um, adding cognitive services right on the worker nodes of your, your cluster. And so the basic idea behind a Helm chart, Helm, if you're not familiar with it, is aims to be the package manager for Kubernetes. And so in the same way that you use apt-get or pip, and it's a nice one-liner, and you apt-get install, you know, uh, nano, and suddenly you have a text editor, or you app get install vim, and you suddenly have a horrible waste of time. Like, uh, you can really easily um, add programs in just single liners. And this is what Helm aims to do with whole distributed architectures, where you have a Kubernetes cluster, and you just want to say, like, oh, I want Elasticsearch. So you Helm install Elasticsearch, and boom, it sets up this crazy thing with load balancers and multiple machines and persistent volume mounts. and all this crazy stuff that you think would be require a lot of legwork in order to do. And what's also nice about Helm is that you can compose these packages where you can depend on packages, you can pipe in um, arguments to these packages and, and modify these packages. And so it's a, it's a general framework for 
abstraction on Kubernetes. And so um, a bit about the kind of structure of this Helm chart that he created. Um, of course, it has a Spark cluster. It's using Spark standalone as opposed to the Spark on Kubernetes work just because that hasn't really fully cooked yet. But as soon as it does cook, we'll swap out the standalone for that so we get nice dynamic scaling other than just horizontal pod auto scaling in Kubernetes. And it's got um, the ability to add in a cognitive service al alongside the Spark cluster. And there's a few different options here that you can do. Um, you know, if you, let's say your cognitive service takes a really long time to run, like it's doing a lot. Like OCR is a particular example that takes a while because it has to parse the image, has to feed it through a convolutional network and extract out information. And so that takes a long time and you're really fundamentally gated in your computation by the amount of OCR juice you have lying around. And so in this particular case, you'd want to really have a lot of pods, a lot of threads running OCR, and you talk to that through an abstraction that routes you to one of these particular threads. But say you have a really fast service, one that you're not really gated on, then you might want something that is um, one service per worker, and these workers talk locally to it. And so that's something that's also possible on Kubernetes, where you can um, you know, speak to a service and be routed to the closest one that you have. And so it's a nice generalization in that you can have uh, that kind of elasticity of scaling out your hard work, but you also have that locality of using the ones that are as close to you as possible on the network so that you can default to local, but if that one crashes, you go back to the, the service and you try again. And so what's nice is that this is kind of a one-liner. We have our own Helm chart to do this, and we're working to integrate this into the, the official stable Helm chart. We have a PR out, and we've gone through a few rounds of revision on that. So hopefully we'll get that done in the next week or so. And so now we get to the, the fun part, which is how do we actually kind of use the cognitive services on Spark to make cool stuff? And so I'll show you an example that we've been working on before. It's called Gen Studio. This work was done by a group of, well, done by the Microsoft AI Development Acceleration Program, done by uh, a hackathon between Microsoft, the Met, and MIT. And then the torch was really carried by a group of MIT externs. They are kind of uh, here at Microsoft for a month, and they are like a SWAT team, and they work on fun stuff. And so this is um, designed to be an outreach website for the Met. They host it. And so the idea is that you kind of pick uh, an object from the Met's open access collection. And then you can then have it hooked up to a GAN on the back end. So over here on the left, um, what this is is a computer generated image. This is not a real piece of art. This is dreamed up by a deep network. And you can kind of explore this in real time and interpolate between the pieces of the Met. And we'll talk to the back end and kind of generate new, crazy, funky looking pieces of art. And when you're satisfied with your crazy creation, you can explore similar and find things that are visually similar to the things in the actual Met collection. And now you have a full search API that you can search for your favorite things like tigers and uh, click on one and be brought to the, the Met's official website so you can learn more. So this kind of provides you a way to explore some of the latest and greatest in photorealistic art generation, but then also hook it up to some real art and be able to explore a real collection. And so uh, some of the components of this work really relied heavily on the cognitive services on Spark, because in order to actually create this kind of an app, we had to take the entire Mets collection and do a lot of processing and turn it into a searchable web database. So the first kind of step was intelligent image annotation. So the Met released around 400,000 images under open access. And so in order to download these 400,000 images, I mean, you can write a, a one-off Python script to do that, but we thought it would be nice to just be able to download them using uh, the download from URLs function so that it does it in parallel and it does it really quickly. Then furthermore, you want to be able to search these images via English input. You want to be able to say, find me all the fish and have this come up. Even though if you have a picture of a fish, there's no guarantee that there's like the author is named fish or the exhibit is named fishes. 
And so um, you want to be able to associate that natural language input with the actual images. And so this is where we use the describe image skill on Spark in that we have this data frame of images that we get from the Mets service, and we pipe them through describe image, and this will return, in a similar way as seeing AI, a verbal description that's then searchable. And then uh, we wanted to provide this kind of reverse image search functionality, so we have to get their deep feature nearest neighbors. And uh, a little bit on that. To actually make a reverse image search engine is, is a lot easier than you might think. Um, you can do this with off-the-shelf tools like we did, where effectively the idea is that you take an image and you featureize it with a deep network. And uh, deep networks, when they're well-trained, will start to understand the platonic components of your image. Like, it will start to understand that an image is composed up of objects, and these objects have edges and corners and 3D depth and, and, and actual meaning in the real world, in some sense. Like, these nets that are trained on ImageNet, this large collection of um, millions of images, uh, understand things like they have animal detectors, they have dog detectors, they have all sorts of neurons that fire when they get particular platonic inputs. And so the idea is that in pixel space, similarity doesn't mean anything. That if you have a picture of a dog and you translate it slightly to the left and you look at its difference in pixel distance, like Euclidean distance in pixels, it's going to be huge. Although, intuitively, there's, not, there's no real difference between a one pixel translation of an image and, and um, its original image. And so that's what these deep features really capture. They capture invariance to a lot of um, you know, mundane translations that you and I might take for granted. And so this particular space is the space you want to look for your nearest neighbors in. And so the idea is that if you have a query image, you can find the nearest image in this deep latent space, and that image that you find will be semantically similar to the query image. And we do this using, uh, you can either use SparkML's locality-sensitive hashing algorithm, or you, we used uh, Spotify's Annoy, which is approximate nearest neighbors. Oh yeah, I think it's the oh why. Um, and so that's like a, a in-memory really fast way. And it kind of performs this tree and does this uh, complicated hashing scheme so that when you give it a target image, it responds really quickly with its nearest neighbors. And so we have a few examples of nearest neighbors here where it, it really gives you these hilarious things that come out of the, the Mets um, actual workflow. This is a picture of my cat, and it got matched with uh, the Virgin Mary holding a baby, which I thought was very funny. <laughs> so once you have these, what we effectively did is made a, a nearest neighbor server that was also backed by Spark. And then we can query that using a, a Spark computation. So not only can we augment these images with their verbal descriptions, we can also augment them with their nearest neighbors to give you the ability to say, like, explore similar images as this and things like this. And finally, the last kind of component that we hook into using HTTP on Spark is Azure Search. So Azure Search is uh, Microsoft's offering that lets you create really fast easy to use web search engines on your own corpuses of data. And they have a push API, and we've kind of mapped this push API into a new Spark sync, so that in the same way that you write uh, like spark.write.kafka to write to your Kafka database, or spark.write.parquet you know, to write to a parquet file, you can say spark.write.azure search, and write to an Azure search index, and basically take your entire data frame and send it on up there as fast as humanly possible. And so what this uh, search sync allowed us to do is kind of the final endpoint where we take these images, we enrich them with image searchable fields, we enrich them with nearest neighbors, we enrich them with all sorts of intelligent metadata, and then we use HTTP on Spark to push these in and create this new sync in um, a very easy way. It was only a few lines of code because we just need to specify the schemas that they accepted, and it kind of fell out of HTTP on Spark for free. And so I mentioned that this is kind of part of a larger effort, and this larger effort is called Microsoft Machine Learning for Apache Spark. It's a place where Microsoft puts a lot of its open source contributions to Apache Spark. So we've, um, all of these cognitive service bindings are open source. Um, our previous talk just um, an hour ago was on Spark serving, which is a way to not use Spark as a web client, but use Spark as a web server itself and have it be low latency. 
We've done uh, Lime, so model interpretability on Spark. This one is particularly useful because Lime is a very compute intensive black box model interpretation framework, and it really benefits from having Spark to scale it out. LightGBM is Microsoft's uh, distributed gradient boosted tree framework, and it's like GPU accelerated and things, but it's a little uh, tedious sometimes when you have to remember your MPI commands and you have to init your MPI rings. So we've added that to SparkML so that you can use the nice SparkML syntax and not think about MPI at all. We've added deep networks and we've added HTTP itself as a protocol. And so these are just a few of the, the top features that we have, but we are adding every single day and it's more or less the place where we store all of our code to share across all of our different projects. And so in conclusion, you can now embed cognitive services directly into your Spark workflows in a way that's idiomatic with everything else in the Spark ecosystem. You can harness your Spark cluster to make it into its own microservice orchestrator. If you use Spark on Kubernetes, this is really natural. And you can get started now with live examples. We've taken you know, a subset of the stuff we've done for the Met, turned it into a CICD example workflow. Um, we've also done this for arbitrary services. You can learn how to contact dogs as a service using HTTP on Spark. And uh, we're open source, so if you guys like to contribute, if you want to know anything, let us know. Drop us a line. Um, we'll gladly accept contributions. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and thank you to everyone who worked on this project. This would not be possible without um, amazing leadership from Sudarshan. Um, LightGBM on Spark was all Ilya. He's a machine at coding. The Microsoft Nerd team kind of created that whole uh, app that you saw today. The MIT externship program helped a lot. Deliso, Casey, Karthik, Manan, Teo, and Alejandro really powered through that Helm chart. And uh, the rest of the organization really provided a nice ecosystem to do all of this work in. So thank you. Great. It seems we have a few minutes left. So uh, we're going to take questions now. And if uh, you guys just want to line up behind that mic, that would be most convenient. If you don't want to, I can walk over as well to get you the mic. So whatever you guys prefer. Just raise your hand if you want me to walk over. Thanks very much for the talk. You mentioned that some of the services are going to be available as Docker uh, images that you can run on your own infrastructure. Um, will those be able to take advantage of uh, GPUs on infrastructure? So right now, none of these are GPU accelerated, but um, I'm sure that they, there will be some GPU accelerated services coming soon. You know, it's like the cognitive services really are a way to expose all of the crazy AI that's going on in Microsoft. And so there will be definitely a lot of that going on in GPUs. Do you have any other questions? Oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, I guess we're, we just finished the time for the session. I mean, Thank you so much, Mark. This Thanks, was a great guys. great talk. I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. And yeah, uh, a reminder to everyone, if you could rate and review the session on the app, that'd be fantastic. Thank you.